Before we start our worship today, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, thank you so much for this privilege of Sabbath day, Lord. And as we sing praises to your name, may it be, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will be in the midst of us, that we may be able to reflect your songs. Please forgive us for all of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For our first song, let us sing, I Sing the Mighty Power of God.
Happy Sabbath, Church. Happy Sabbath. I warmly welcome you all to our Sabbath School program this morning. Fellow youth, fellow church, and to our guests this morning, I see new faces. And I just want to say I welcome, I welcome you all to our program this morning. As we sing and worship our Lord this Sabbath, may the praises that we bring glory unto His name will bring happiness unto His throne. Our participants this morning will be projected on the screen. Before I take my seat, I would like to read to you a verse in Genesis 2, 2 and 3. It says, And on the seventh day, God finished His work that He had been doing. And on the seventh day, He rested from all His work. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it, He rested from all of the work that He has created and all that He has done. Once again, welcome everyone and happy Sabbath. Excellent. Let us all stand for our opening song, To God Be the Glory. To God be the glory, great things He hath done. So loved He the world that He gave us His Son, who yielded His life and atonement for sin. requesting everyone to please kneel down for our prayer. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, we would like to thank you for this opportunity of Sabbath day. Lord, as we study your words this morning, please give us some heavenly knowledge so that we can understand your word easily. Thank you for the protection of 
every day, O oh God. And please forgive us our sins that committed against you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Mic test. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. Good morning and happy Sabbath, church. 
Good morning! So thank you so much for that wonderful message and song. So let's praise God for this wonderful Sabbath He has given us. A day for reflection, thanksgiving, and worship. So since this is the last Sabbath of the month, so it's a fitting time to focus on giving thanks. So that's why let me have a few moments to share some thoughts on the importance of thanksgiving in our faith. So as we observed, brothers and sisters, so it's easy for us to get, uh, to get caught, caught up in the busyness of life and forget to express gratitude for the blessings we have received. So we may take our blessings for granted or become accustomed to them, which can lead us to overlook the source of, mo of our blessings. So in the Bible, there are different uh, key texts or verses that constantly remind us to give thanks to God for all that He has done for us. So this morning, our key text can be found in the book of Psalm, chapter 107, verse 1. It says here, Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. So our key text this morning conveys about only three points. First one is gratitude. So this verse calls us to express our thanks or give thanks to, the, to God. And this thankfulness is based on God's inherent goodness. And the second one, the second point is God's goodness. Where in this verse affirms God's goodness and this is, isn't just about pleasant things happening but about God's character and his overall plan in our lives. The third one is enduring love where this verse emphasizes that God, God's love or his mercy, so in some translation it refers to us the in, is everlasting or endures forever. So this means God's love for humanity or to us is constant and reliable. So this essence of this verse reminds us to be grateful to God for His unfailing goodness and love. So in this case, thanking God, I know some of us experience difficulties or experience struggle to express gratitude to Him because sometimes we feel, honestly me also, feel that we are distant or we are disconnected from Him. But however, it's important to remember that God is always present in our lives and has provided, provided us with our, our countless uh, needs or Yes, needs in our daily lives. So, but the question this morning, brothers and sisters, why is it important? Why is it so important to give thanks to God? So the answers or the answer lies in recognizing the source of our blessings that we have. So in addition here in the book of uh, James, chapter 1, verse 17, I want everybody to please read it with me. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. So this verse is a great reminder also that everything we have is gift is a gift from God and it is only through His grace and mercy that we have them. So as human beings and as Christians and as Seventh-day Adventists, there are many things we can be thankful for. So that's why this morning I, would, I, would, I want to share it with you, some of the things that we can be thankful for. So the first one is life and health. So one of the greatest blessings we have is the gift of life and good health. 
So we should be grateful for every day we are given and for the ability to enjoy the world around us. The second one, family and friends that we have. So why we need to be thankful for having family and friends? So God allows us to connect with others and build community and at the same time, relationship. So we can be grateful for the relationships we form and the impact we have on the lives of others. Because I believe having loving and supportive family and friends so is another thing that we can be thankful for. So these relationships gives or bring joy and a essence or a sense of belonging to our lives. So our family and friends are the source of our love and at the same time support Laughter, inspiration, and legacy. The next one is God's love and salvation. So as Christians, we can be grateful also for God's love and the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. So this gives us three things. Hope, peace, and the promise of eternal life. And the fourth one, we have here, nature. So as you can see outside, you can see beautiful trees, tall trees, flowering plants. We are surrounded by the beautiful mountains. So nature, or the beauty and the wonder of nature is another thing that we can be thankful for. So nature is a blessing that provides us with many resources from our daily provisions. And it promotes health and wellness as well. And it reminds us of the diversity of God's creation and gives us also the opportunity to be good stewards of the earth. So the next, we have material blessings. So it could be money, possessions, land, houses, food, clothing, and a shelter that make our lives more comfortable. And the next one is the opportunities that we have. So we need to be thankful for the opportunities like having the education, employment, or jobs that we have, and the chance to make a positive impact on the world around us. So we are provided with the opportunity to pursue our dreams and goals to build relationships and to make a positive impact on the world or to the persons around us. And last, we have here the challenges and growth. Why we need to thank, have, uh, to thank for having a challenges or struggles in life. So I believe even challenges and difficult experiences can be something to be thankful for. And I know you believe this also. So these moments can help us grow and learn and can bring us closer to God and to others. While suffering and trials may be difficult to go through, so they can also be blessings in disguise in our lives. And having these challenges in life, they can draw us closer to God and help us to grow and mature, deepen our empathy and understanding. So, I would like to share one of the clearest examples of the importance of giving thanks can, that can be found in the story of the ten lepers. And this is one of my favorite uh, story in the Bible. So, it can be found in the book of Luke chapter 17 verses 11 to 19, where in this story, Jesus healed 10 lepers, but only one returned to thank him. And this is also a great reminder to us that it is very important to remember that we should not take our blessings that comes from the Lord for granted, but rather give thanks and praise to God for everything he has done for us. And also, according to Ms. Ellen G. White, 
He also wrote extensively about the importance of thanksgiving. So in her book, Steps to Christ, she wrote that, Let us keep our minds stayed upon God. Let us not forget to praise Him for His goodness and mercy. As we do this, we shall find that our hearts are filled with joy and gratitude and that we are strengthened and blessed by the power of Holy Spirit. So there are several ways in which we can give thanks to God for all the blessings in our lives. So we have different thanks to thank for our family and friends, the nature we have, the material blessings we have, the possessions. And there are several ways in which we can give thanks to God. One of these is through prayer. The second one is praise and Sabbath worship. The third one, uh, bringing back the tithes and the offerings that is for God. That is part sang aton nga uh, ways how to we can give thanks to God. And lastly, the most important is living a life of obedience. So before I take my seat, so let us always remember to give thanks to God for all that He has done for us. And let us not take our blessings for granted. Let us always remember this. But rather recognize that they are gifts from Him. So may we be reminded also of the words of the psalmist. In Psalm chapter 107 verse 1. It says there, Give thanks to the Lord for He is good. His love endures forever. So may our lives be filled with the goodness and love of God. And may we also have a heart of thanksgiving as well. And may God bless us all as we strive to live lives of gratitude and thanksgiving. And may we never forget to express our gratitude to God for all the blessings He has bestowed upon us. Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. Hello. Hello, Mike Tess. I put my trust in Him and seek to follow Him in faith Because He lives Because He lives I shall find strength to stand against the tempter's power This is my refuge and defense in every troubled heart because he lives, because he lives, because he lives I, I can bear whatever burden may be mine. I am encircled in the arms of love divine. Because he lives, because he lives, he lives, he will bear. Banish every shadow of my pain Every sorrow will be swallowed up in Him For in His hand is healing for the weary soul This I know, this I know 
because he lives. Because he lives, my heart is free. With peace amid a world of fear And through the blindness of the night In Him I rest secure Because He lives Because He lives There is no task so great that I cannot endure I bear no heartache that this tender mercy cannot cure because he lives, because he lives, because he lives I can bear whatever burden may be mine. I am encircled in the arms of love divine, because he lives, because he lives. Banish every shadow of my pain Every sorrow will be swallowed up in Him For in His hand is healing for the weary soul This I know This I know because he lives, because he lives, I will fear no darkness. Because he lives, I will walk in light. Because he lives, I will praise his kindness. Because he lives, hope shines ever bright. Because he lives. His righteousness Because he lives I'll follow where he leads Because he lives I shall conquer Even death And I shall live And I shall live Because he lives Because he lives Because he lives in Christ I will and glorify His name, and with a willing voice of gratitude proclaim, my Savior lives, because He lives, he, lives. He, he will banish every shadow of my pain, every sorrow will be swallowed up in Him. For in his hand is healing for the weary soul. This I know. This I know. Because he I am inviting everyone who are celebrating their birthday, baptism, wedding anniversary, or any special event that you want to celebrate in this month of March, please come forward for a special prayer. Again, for those who are celebrating their birthday, baptism, wedding anniversary, or any special event that you want to celebrate in this month of March, I am inviting you to come forward for a special prayer.
Again, we would like to invite everyone who are celebrating their birthdays, their baptism, and their anniversaries. Thank you for joining with us. I'd like to invite also the congregation and all in attendance today to please stand with our celebrants as we pray. Please join with us by standing. Let us pray. Our great and wonderful Father in heaven, Lord, we're so much thankful and we want to bring all praises to your name for the wonderful things you have done in our lives. Lord, we know there are many challenges, difficulties that we have surmounted, oh Lord. Thank you so much for giving us the power, for motivating us to move forward and to push in our limits so that you can create in us your nature. You can form in us the likeness of your Son, Jesus, that is worthy of A pleasant morning, everyone. To our online viewers, we welcome you all to Central Philippine Adventist College Church. And we are happy that we are here with you again to uh, share with you insights from our lesson. And our discussions this morning, I'm happy that we have here some discussions and we request our discussions to please switch on your microphone so that we can all be seen in the screen. I'm happy that we have uh, Mom Laren Bernardino from the School of Arts, Sciences, and Education. She is our uh, with us coordinator for the program Elementary well, Education. Uh, Ma'am Laren, before I introduce our next uh, discussion, can you give your short uh, greetings to our online viewers? Hello, everyone. Pleasant Sabbath morning from CPAC. Okay, thank you very much, Ma'am Laren. Now our next discussion is Sir Ellis Gold Sunico, our... Uh, staff from our management information systems and our uh, Sir Ellis, can you introduce yourself and uh, greet our online viewers? Good morning, everyone, and happy Sabbath. It's a pleasure to be part of this uh, group this morning to discuss the lessons. I'm currently uh, also uh, having responsibility with our ETSB, our education that says Ellis and their home team. Good morning, everyone, and let's just enjoy our discussion this morning. Thank you, Sir Ellis. Thank yes, uh, for our online viewers, I forget he other of the was this of um, the section there for our education that saves village. He is our dean there. Okay, um, let's uh, go on with our discussion. And uh, before we uh, have our opening prayer, I'll just ask one of our discussions this morning. Uh, may I first read uh, our first read key text our and introduce the title of our lesson for this morning? Um, we, um, and I know that you have enjoyed, you have been following our lesson. Uh, for the whole quarter from January until this week, you have enjoyed reading the Psalms, and of course, Psalms are also connected with the other text from, uh, I mean, with the other uh, was these books in the Bible. And I know this morning that you will enjoy our discussion. And uh, our key text for this morning is found in Psalm twenty-seven fourteen. It says, "Wait on the Lord, be of good courage." And he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Okay, brothers and sisters, this is our memory text. I hope you have memorized that one. That is a text that will give us always hope and also peace in our hearts. Wait on the Lord. I hope we are patiently waiting for the Lord. And we will see this morning how we will wait on the Lord. But before we go on, may I ask Mam Laren to please offer a prayer so that we can... Uh, start with uh, 
the guidance from the Lord. Shall we bow our heads in prayer? Almighty God, loving Father, we thank you for this blessed Sabbath day you have given us. Thank you for this opportunity to study your word. And now we invite your presence, Lord, as we discuss uh, heavenly things and the things that you have promised us. We pray that you will guide us to understand our lesson. Bless our online viewers. Bless CPAC family, CPAC community, and everyone who is worship, uh, who are worshiping with us today. Thank you for hearing our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for that prayer, Ma'am Laren. Now, let's uh, delve with what we have to deal with this morning, wait on the Lord. The word waiting, I don't know if you like waiting, but it's part of life <laughs> wherever we go. Uh, wherever we go, we always have to wait. We, uh, we always, uh, when we go to the bank, we are on queue and we have to wait until service is being given to us. Everywhere we go to the cafeteria for our students here, they really have to wait to be served by our ser uh, by our servers in the cafeteria and wherever actually is part of life. No? But this morning, as we conclude this quarter study of the Psalms, our spiritual journey, um, I hope you have also journeyed with us through the Psalms. Our spiritual journey has encompassed all before God's majesty. We have seen through the Psalms God's majesty, the joy also of his deliverance of his people, the surrender in lament. We have seen a lot of lamentations in Psalms and the anticipation of universal worship. Now our journey continues with hope in the Lord. Uh, I mean, Hope in the Lord's coming, we always say that one. And <clears throat> this journey or this hope in the Lord's coming can be summarized in the phrase, wait on the Lord. Waiting isn't passive in this text. We will see how to wait on the Lord this morning. It is an expression of trust and faith, transforming darkness into, shall we say, expectant light, strengthening hearts with hope and peace, and also motivating diligent work in the Lord's mission. Now, waiting on the Lord brings rich rewards, and we will see that this morning from our discussions. We know that the Lord is faithful to His promises. He is really faithful. If that has been proven years, years back, or way back in the Old Testament times until the New Testament times, now there are some promises there that are still to be fulfilled, and he, if He has fulfilled the promises in the past, we are sure that he will be fulfilling those promises in the future. Okay, let's start right away. Uh, as I have said at the beginning, I don't know, Sir Ellis or Mom, uh, Laren, if you want to wait. <laughs> uh, but as I have said, waiting is really part of life. Our life is full of small and big waits. Uh, I don't know how Sir Ellis felt here when uh, the first time his wife was pregnant and he they are anticipating the birth of the first child, the first child. Mm -hmm. yeah i mean may i hear from you i'd like to hear how yeah, that like wait, uh, how you felt waiting uh, good That's morning it. everyone once again uh yeah exactly waiting is uh, really part of our life uh whether we like it or not mm -hmm. and so since it is inevitable, what we need is the right attitude in waiting. And just like I'm being asked now, mm -hmm. how I waited when my firstborn is coming out, mm -hmm. I'm just a uh, make a. Uh, I'm not really that uh, uh, so expressive or what do you call that mm -hmm. uh, so emotional in on that yeah. uh, on that aspect. I just stay calm. <laughs> 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 I just stay calm and just wait for the baby to come out and i hope that uh both of them will get uh, is okay will be mm -hmm. well and that will be very safe yeah yes. thank you for that yeah there are really people who are just very cool shall we say they're cool in waiting and things mom Laren, have you had that experience of waiting and it looks like oh, what will be the result no? so can you share a little on that oh mom joy uh waiting for me is an irritant <laughs> <laughs> yes, but uh, spiritually, I reflected uh, that 
it's not good to be irritated by mm -hmm. constantly waiting, especially if you are waiting on the Lord. Because mm -hmm. waiting on the Lord is a positive waiting. Mm -hmm. Waiting on God will sure, surely result in a happy life free from uh -huh. sin and okay. uh, i also realized that waiting on god does does not mean that he is behind us uh -huh. god is already there he existed okay. even before us he exists before everything so i think as human beings uh, we will not demand on when God will keep his promise because mm -hmm. he is God. He he knows everything. So this kind of waiting is just telling us that we have to hang on. We have mm -hmm. to have that deep longing for God, thirsting for him, hungering for him. And uh, I think this kind of waiting implies perseverance because uh it's it's a kind of uh, character formation the the longer we wait the more patient we'll be and uh, i think uh we'll not uh, become hopeless because uh thinking that oh do gay na wala lang gihapon but we'll have that uh, uh anticipation that uh, mm -hmm. despite that uh, period of time, we have a God who will keep his promises. Thank you, Ma'am Laren, for that one. I think you have said something now about really our lesson. Yes, waiting yes. may be maybe an irritant, <laughs> but uh, really it's part of life. Okay, let's uh, look into this one. We don't always like waiting, no? but uh, then about what then is waiting for God. Mom Lauren has said something uh, about that one. The notion of waiting on the Lord. Uh, when you say wait on, sometimes it it, it, it's, it means uh, to serve. But actually in this text that we'll be, uh, was this, we will be learning this morning, it's actually the word wait there. Wait for the Lord. And so we will look into that one. Now the book of Psalms has a lot of, shall we say, imploring saying wait on the lord on or the lord. sometimes this th this phrase can be said hope in the lord or do you have hope in the lord these are found in psalms uh, in psalm 27 14 another uh, and the 37 7 and a lot there even in the new testament there is always that was i'm i'm, I'm opening my my bible here and uh, really look into was this some of these things and there is always that uh, was this that phrase wait on the lord and uh, so we will look into this one. Mamlerin has already started on how to wait on the Lord. Now, what is this waiting? What kind of waiting is this? Uh, Mamlerin has said positive waiting. So, all these texts here, we 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 don't have uh, was this we don't have time to read all these texts. But we will just tell our audience that if you read all these texts from our lesson, Psalm twenty seven fourteen, Psalm thirty seven seven, and uh, other was this other other text here psalm 41 uh it even says there i waited patiently for the lord and he inclined to me and heard me and the rest of the text even in romans um may I say yes romans 8 18 mm. to 25 it's actually telling us no how to wait on the lord okay and there is hope there that the, the word hope is also mentioned there uh, sir ellis can you tell us more what do these texts implore about god's people or what do we have to do uh, about waiting on the lord uh thank you ma'am uh i would like also to say a little bit about this this word of waiting mm -hmm. yeah the the activity the experience of waiting connotes it could be both excitement or anxiety depending on what we are waiting for yeah yeah it depends so it really implies it really uh implies patience and sometimes boredom or weariness, especially if the waiting is taking so long. Mm -hmm. But I see here that in the activity of waiting, two things that could make waiting uh, exciting or or worrying, it depends on the significance or the promise of the object. 
And the second is the certainty of, cert certainty of fulfillment. So here, if we wait for something better, bright, and joyous, it surely makes our waiting exciting and positive. And on the other hand, if what is we are waiting is something bad, mm -hmm. it surely t turns our mood negatively. <laughs> the second thing is the certainty of fulfillment of our waiting. If we wait for something that is better, joyful, and it is something that is very sure to come, it surely makes our waiting filled with hope and excitement. Mm -hmm. So our lesson tells us that waiting on the Lord is something that gives us the best promise of something better, something that's really worth the wait. Yeah. And the best part of and the best part and the most reassuring is that we are certain that it is going to happen. So we will deal. So here, what is being implored here is uh, the call of waiting on our Sunday is that this is a call. We have no choice. We are going to wait. <laughs> yeah. Whether we like it or not, we have to wait. But here, God gives us the option to wait on him. And there is a great promise that we will reap in the end. If we wait for him. Thank you, Sir Ellis. That's really very assuring. Yes, waiting depends upon what we are waiting for. If we are waiting for something that is really unsure of, sometimes no, you are waiting for the result of our physical test. Oh my, that is, uh, was this, there's anxiety there whether the test is good or the results are good or not or in our favor or not. But however, for God, thank you, Sir Ellis, for really emphasizing that one. Waiting for the Lord, it's really, was this, it's reassuring. And uh, as what Mom Laren is also saying, it, uh, it, it was this, there is the word perseverance there. It develops our per perseverance there because we know that that is, we are anticip anticipating for something good, not something that we are unsure of, not something that is bad to happen, but we are anticipating for something that is good. And so it makes us what? Excited to wait for what the Lord has promised us. But uh Shall we say a little only on how do we wait for the Lord? What are the things that we need to do? Do we just have to sit down and say, hey, hey, Lord, you are wait uh, we are waiting for your coming. Okay, so we'll just be here. Go to church, go home, and then do something. Or let's say give offerings or give our tithes, something like that. Uh, can you share? Let me start with Mom Laren this time. How do we wait? wait. Do we have something to do? Oh, thank you, Mom Joy. Uh, our attitude while waiting really matters. So mm. I think we get bored or we are irritated waiting for something because we are not doing anything. Same thing with uh, waiting on the Lord. While waiting on the Lord, if we keep ourselves busy in serving Him in our family, in our church, in our community, our waiting would not be boring, but exciting, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, Ma'am Laren. Yes, and uh, our lesson is even saying, hang on, just keep hanging on. Uh, sometimes, uh, we have heard already, uh, the, the was this the saying, very common among us Seventh-day Adventists, the Lord is coming soon, or the second coming is there already. And we even have the song, at the door, at the door. But then, of course, uh, I'm I'm glad we have this text this morning in Psalms that we when we wait on the Lord just hang on because even in Psalm where is that Psalm sixty three one uh, oh God you are my God I will seek you earnestly so when we wait we have to seek God earnestly and it looks like uh, the the psalmist here is saying my soul thirsts for you my flesh yearns for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water so there is something that. Uh, well, while the wait is long, we must not succumb to despair. That's something really that we have to uh, we have to uh, look into because some some people will say, "Hey, even your grandparents and the lolo of the lolo of your lolo has I mean had said nangamatay na lang sila nung sang una pa Christ is coming and then until now, but the wait should not be passive, Sir Elis. Uh, do you have something else to say about this waiting? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, the way you see it, uh, I think, uh, as we have said, that uh, waiting is, is not an, a passive thing, but uh, it's an active activity. And I think our lessons outlined us of what is waiting meant about, uh, especially on Monday, that here, uh, the title is Peace of a Wind Child. Wind, mm -hmm. wind child. 
Yeah. Ng lutas. Gin lutas. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, uh, because here in this in this section of our lesson mentioned particularly about pride. Oh yeah. Pride is something that could blind us or totally block us from waiting on the Lord because it corrupts our minds, our reasoning, and lead us to believe more on ourselves than trust God and His promise to give us something better. We are advised by Paul, we are encouraged by Paul that we are to work out our salvation. So we know it's very clear that waiting upon the Lord is, we are waiting for the Lord is, we are waiting for His second return. And while we are waiting, we are not just going to sit idly and do nothing. But we are here encouraged by Paul to work out our salvation. How do we do that? It makes, because here, pride makes us self-sufficient as we are, as what we are described in, in, in Revelation being the Laodicean church, the end time church. And so here our lesson uh, mentions, uh, may I quote, the deceitfulness of pride is that it causes the proud to become self-centered and unable to look beyond themselves. The proud are thus blinded to the higher reality of God. So many, because of, because of their human knowledge, of their human intelligence, they tend not to believe anymore about God. They tend to believe more on this uh, false science, I would say, because true science really what harmonize with heart is in harmony with the, with the Bible. But here people who thought themselves as being bright and being intelligent of this, this worldly knowledge become what? Unbeliever of God. So in contrast, the righteous lift their eyes to God. The acknowledgement of God's greatness makes them humble and free from self-seeking and vain ambition. Mm -hmm. So indeed, Proverbs 19, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Here, because if we don't acknowledge God, our ambition is only about self and about these worldly affairs of the worldly endeavors of the worldly, of the worldly things. So, but here, if we are settled in God, our eyes are lifted above are lifted towards heaven. So here, the way I understand here, ma'am, yeah. the, the, the waiting process here is the winning process. Described here is applied to our Christian life as the maturing process of our faith mm -hmm. and trust in God. And so the wonderful thing in this process is that we learn to eat solid food, which is the word of God. Mm -hmm. We maintain and even deepen our trust in God as more like that of a child, which is void of pride, self-centeredness, and self-dependence. So in essence, waiting on the Lord is actually becoming a wind child until we become adult into a full stature of man who cannot be tossed to and fro by doctrines of men. So as I understand, ma'am, mm -hmm. the final product of our Christianity is described in Ephesians 4, 13 to 15. May I read? Till we all come in the, in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of Son of God unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about by the every wind of doctrine, by the slate of men, and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in way to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. So here, waiting is not only just staying idle, but we have to grow into mm -hmm. the full being of Christ. And I may add uh, in First Peter 2.2, 2, as newborn babes desire the sincere, sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. So ye, we, we have been like newborn babes, but sadly some of us remain this, just like babes. <laughs> uh, here, the beauty here is that we, we should remain like babes in our desire for the sincere milk of God. But our stature should not be like remain babies. So yeah. here, when we grow in God, our lives are no longer governed and dictated by pride and selfishness. But as we mature in our Christian walk, we become led by the Holy Spirit. That's how I understand the waiting on the Lord here on this aspect. Thank you very much, Sir Ellis, for saying that one. Yes, we are like wind child, you know, wind. Nung, uh, what was that in Bisaya? Nalotas? Mm, okay. Nalotas. Yeah. But of course, after weaning that child, the child should grow. Okay, and it. Uh, thank you for that metaphor. You are saying that we should not just be dependent on just milk or liquid. Uh, was that food? But we should be eating now what solid foods. So dependent upon God. Yes, uh, Sir Ellis actually was talking about Psalm one thirty one, and uh, there is peace of a wind child. Like 
it, it, it's like David saying the, the author of Psalm 131 uh, was really David and he it, it was like when he was uh, when he wrote this uh, David was appoint, anointed no, as the future king when he was still a humble shepherd he defeated a giant won a thousand battles and finally acclaimed as king over Israel but then David realized that his heart was haughty and his when he came to maturity what what happened to him he said my heart should not be haughty anymore okay and my eyes uh are lofty or shall sh shall we say looking already on things that are above and think yes yeah, something like that mom Laren, i think you have still something to say about this one uh I, I agree with you, Mom Joy, and also with Sir Ellis. And I like the, the thing that you have said about maturity, spiritual maturity, because spiritual uh, mature people do not eat uh, baby foods. So we have to increase our intake by self-feeding, meaning... Mm -hmm uh when we s develop that uh, skill of feeding ourselves with the word of god it makes us strong it makes mm -hmm. us uh uh improve in, in our spiritual walk however it says there although we are wind and detached from our mother or yeah the source of our dependence our lesson is teaching us that uh, we can still snuggle, no? snuggle to God's breast, to God's love, and mm -hmm. not worry about anything. Just like babies, they do not worry about what to eat after, uh, you know, worry-free ang mga bata. Yan lang. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Ma'am Laren. I think we have said enough already about uh, peace of a wind child. And we have still to be dependent upon God, but we should grow in stature. Like we should now learn how to fend ourselves, no? Or, or in simple terms, we should now learn how to study the Bible by ourselves. Really look into uh, what's this? By ourselves, we should uh, now, uh, like, like, grown-up people who knows where to look for uh, the source of food and uh, we we should look into the bible now N not just be dependent upon others feeding us about god's word but we should by ourselves be uh, already doing that one now let's look into was this since uh, our time is running fast this time another thing here and psalm 126 this is just uh, let me see this is just a short sum also now there are only uh, six verses here and it will look into uh how do we wait in difficult times now here this is a psalm when the lord turned again the captivity of zion we were like them that dream i mean it, there is that phrase over there no in some was this psalm 126 uh, may I just read so that uh, we can, was this quickly. When the Lord brought back the captive once of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with joyful shouting. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has, yes, the Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Restore our captivity, O Lord, as the streams of the south. Those who sow in tears shall reap with joyful shouting. He who goes so and fro weeping carry his bag of seed shall indeed come again with a shout of joy bringing his sheaves with him and i remember the song bringing in the sheaves well um the the what this is the context now of the this verse or this psalm now what gives strength and hope to god's people they were waiting actively for their salvation they were captives in babylon they were for a long time but they had to wait some of them maybe have died already from the time when they were taken captives. Even Daniel was not able to go back no, to Jerusalem. Okay, He was not able to go back to Jerusalem, but he was just there in Babylon. But the thing is, what gave them strength and hope? Uh, these are God's people. What is being said here in the context of this verse that we can apply to our own lives? I think it would be better that we can say it in uh uh, what we can take from this text. May I start from Sir Elias? Uh, I'm, I'm, 
I'm excited to hear from you about this one. Uh, thank you, Mama. Yeah, it's nice to read these psalms, but sometimes it's uh, I there are things that uh, sometimes it's find it I find it difficult to, to really uh, put into into a practical uh, application. So here, uh, waiting on the Lord is what we truly need and do during difficult times. Uh, it's mm -hmm. quite difficult. We cannot really, uh, I cannot really put my, my I cannot really imagine what they are going through mm -hmm. in that situation, being uh, being a bondage in in Jerusalem, being mm -hmm. there away from their loved ones, away from their home hometown, their birthplace. But here, we waiting upon the Lord. Here is what they truly need because. And even for us, when we go through difficult times, because it places us into realization about our lives, about life's realities, and and particularly about our spiritual condition. Mm -hmm. So here, the Psalms here says that the way I understand here is that it is God's word and His promise and His plans mm -hmm. that gives us and puts us in a right perspective and in higher respect perspective it enlightens us of our true situation and of what god has done and has been doing for us and is going to do for us so here the psalm the psalmist and the people here is that they acknowledge that it is only by god's act of deliverance and restoration can they have life and they can have laughter again and happiness in life so this is what they are waiting for and they are longing for for that, uh, for that uh, promise of deliverance and uh, restoration that they will be brought back to their home place. Mm -hmm. And so like us here, if we see our, our journey here on earth, we know that this is just temporary. And we long for the day that we will be, that we will be restored in his, in his new kingdom, in God's kingdom, where, where there is peace and joy for eternity. Yes, thank you, Sir Ellis, for that one. Yes, while waiting, and sometimes, uh, was this? It's hard to wait when we are in pain. <laughs> uh, but uh, was this? This is telling us that there's something we can be joyful even in pain. We can ju be joyful today when e even if we are captive, seemingly the captive, uh, or metaphorically captive by sin in this world. But there is hope. God has already given us all those. Was this? all those uh promises for us sir ellis do you still have something else to say yeah because uh, the way i understand um, uh, not only waiting that we have that is inevitable in our life here on earth mm -hmm. but it's also suffering so we have yeah. no choice with our suffering <laughs> so at least either we suffer without hope or we suffer with hope that god has something better for us in the end thank you thank you for that one mom larry <laughs> I only remember the song, Mom Joy, count your blessing, name them one by one, and see yeah. what God has done. I think uh, th that is my take in this uh, lesson here. Yeah, let's move on, actually, because there is still more was this there is still more exciting things here in the psalms let's move on to psalm 92 here because uh that is in i think it's wednesday lesson because it talks about rest here waiting in god's sabbath rest wait for redemption actually in psalm 92 yeah this is also uh this is a psalm which is uh, i think 15 verses only now this is a psalm that is a worship song and full of thanksgiving and praise to the Lord. If you look into that one, praising for the Lord, that uh, what he has done in behalf of his people. But it is a song also of and for the Sabbath day. And let's look into what are highlighted in this song. Uh, what have you discovered in this song? Because it says here, song for the Sabbath. And there are, when, when it's Sabbath, there are two aspects that we look into. No? So, uh, Mom Leren, can you say something about this one? Waiting in God's Sabbath rest. Okay, Sabbath, song for the Sabbath. We find the two aspects here. This is emphasizing creation and redemption of joy. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I also see that uh, uh, there are so many things that we, we should uh, rejoice during the Sabbath, not only uh, because we can rest physically, 
we can also uh, come to church to worship together yeah worship together and rejoice in the lord we can give him songs because of his uh, sacrifices for us his blessings and everything yeah thank you thank you mom uh, uh, thank you mom Laren, for saying that one sir ellis do you have something to say about this one waiting in god's oh, sabbath man. rest this is another the way i see it this is another kind of uh, difficult uh, difficult sum. Sum. <laughs> <laughs> difficult sum. yeah uh waiting upon the lord waiting on god is involves sabbath observance keeping the sabbath because this is another essential and most practical that we can do as we wait for the lord because the time that we spend and the time the the moment that we acknowledge sabbath is that we acknowledge god's creatorship yeah and when we understand and we believe that god created us it makes a whole lot of difference in mm -hmm. our whole being so it refreshes us of our identity it enriches us of our understanding of who we are understanding of our creator and our connection to him and it depends and strengthens our bond and relationship with our maker so we see here as we wait upon god we are to see around what god has created for us mm -hmm. we are to see his creation and appreciate what he has done for us it it empowers us it, it it enriches us that God is a loving God and he provides everything for us. He, he challenges us to, mm. to consider the sparrows. Mm. They saw that, yet the Heavenly Father feeds them. And so we are worried. While we are here on earth, it's inevitable that we worry also a lot. But God reassures us. The Sabbath reassures us that God takes care of us. And so while we wait, you see, we see a lot of trials, a lot of tribulations. But Jesus said, have peace, have comfort. Huh? Mm -hmm. Do not worry. Yeah. So waiting upon the Lord is resting upon his promise, upon his word, upon yeah. his creatorship. And not only that, because we are we are we are bondage of sin, the Sabbath also promises the freedom from sin. So as we spend time with our family, with our loved ones, and those who love us, it gives us a sense of belongingness also. And we are emotionally and psychologically strengthened and reinvigorated. So bonding with God during Sabbath, because this is a special place, a special space in time that God has specially set aside for us to bond with us. Our Creator is bonding with us in order to recreate us and to fashion us into his likeness. So this is how I see this mom, the waiting on God in God's Sabbath. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well said, Sir Ellis. Well said. Yeah, probably at, at the first glance, when you uh, read this psalm, it may be quite uh, was this it may be quite hard to understand because of a lot of metaphors in here but actually it is was this it is looking into when we go back to god's creation and now creation is also and uh, there is also another thing because when man fell into sin we have to be redeemed and there is uh, i mean this this psalm is telling us actually god's creation and god's <clears throat> redemption so probably what every sabbath day or every rest day that we have, or Sabbath day particularly, every Saturday, we we, we can feel that we are re-anointed. Uh, this is a special word here referring to the oil no? in Psalm 92.10 that is mixed with the sacrifice. But we can share our hope with others because there is always redemption. It, I mean, the word redemption is always what this is always, uh, shall we say, emphasized in here. We It, it does not just uh, stop with, hey, God is giving us rest. We can rest in him, but <clears throat> more so he gives us what is the, the, the assurance of redemption. Let's go, move on because our time is just uh, is limited. Now, <clears throat> another psalm here in Psalm 143. Uh, actually, there are several psalms no, that portray the time of divine redemption since we have talked about redemption. Um, 
<clears throat> Psalm 5, there are Psalm 49. There are a lot actually in Psalms that talk about redemption. And there is that time of day that is symbolically portrayed no, as the time of divine redemption. And we can see why, <clears throat> particularly in uh, in our, our Thursday yeah, uh, yeah. Wednesday or Thursday lesson. Joy comes in the morning. We always say, "Joy comes in the morning." Morning. There is always that. We are always saying uh, morning. And <clears throat> when it's morning, uh, what comes to your mind, Mam, um, Mam What time? This is the time of day, probably that is portrayed here as the time of right. divine uh, redemption. Mam uh, Mam uh, for me, when uh, you say morning. Hope is coming in. Hope is getting in. Uh, lang. It's it's uh, hope. It's uh, a fresh start. It's a new beginning. The end of uh, night. The end of toil. The end of burden. Uh, the mm -hmm. end of uh, negativity, despair, mm -hmm. anguish. Everything, Mom Joy. Uh, hope. Yeah. Morning is. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you for saying that directly. When it's morning, yeah, we can all say it's a fresh start. And the Bible is also telling us that every day, every morning, God's grace is sufficient for the day. So he gives us that one. Sir Ellis, can you give something more about this one? <clears throat> Joy comes in the morning. Oh, morning. <laughs> uh, let me try, ma'am. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, uh, as uh, Mam Larry is uh, uh, saying his part, his her part now. Uh, there's a thought coming to my mind that yeah, we have to waiting upon God is just like uh, waiting on Him on a daily basis and being reassured of His goodness that His faithfulness is new every morning, is new every morning. But more of that is that. We always attach this uh, joy in the morning to the resurrection, the time of resurrection when Jesus will come. Because another inevitable part of our life here is that we will experience death at point in time. Yeah. <clears throat> and when we die, we will be not the we will not be the one who will be in sorrowful. But mm -hmm. as we are still alive, we see the passing away. We experience the passing away of our loved ones. And that is a sorrowful and a painful human experience for everyone. Okay. And so we grieve. But when there is hope with God, and we are reassured that there is a morning that will come that we all will be resurrected, then we grieve. But we grieve not without hope, but we grieve with hope. Yes, thank you for that. I'm... I Hopefully, there is somebody listening that uh, has been given that hope. Thank you, Sir Ellis, for saying that one. And um, may I just read something from Psalm 30, verse 5. Maybe somebody is going through some grief, uh, grief this time. And the, the Lord says, weeping, or this psalm is saying, weeping may last for a night. Night here may be uh, something like when you are feeling really very sorrowful and uh, without hope. But it's only for a night the lord is saying but a shout of joy comes in the morning and of course here um, yes thank you for saying that one sir ellis that yes we grieve but we are not without hope because hope is always there okay <clears throat> and uh there is always that was this there is always that looking forward to that joyous morning when the lord will come um if we can just imagine i mean we cannot imagine the majesty when the lord comes or how, how how happy we would be during the time but at least there is that anticipation of joy that the lord will end all the sorrow in this world the lord will end our our sufferings and even the lord will end sin and we will be with him in that joyful time forever with him <clears throat> so I think for this time, let's have our takeaways from our lesson. And uh, may I start with Mam Larim? Can we wind up? Okay, can you just switch on your... Sorry. Yes, so for this week's lesson, mm -hmm. I have here five W's on waiting. Uh, on waiting, our true character is revealed during the waiting period and then another w on waiting we should be mature 
we have to feed ourselves with uh, spiritual food, God's word, on working next uh, W. So Colossians 3, 23 and 24, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. And on worship, specifically on Sabbath, we have to take it as a delight, a time to rest, a time to reflect on God's creative and redemptive power. And my number five W is, wow, rejoice in the Lord always. Okay, let's rejoice in God's promises. Trust that he will keep his word. He will come again. And let's be jubilant every day for this glorious victory. Thank you so much, Mom Alan, for those W's that you have given us. Yes, brothers and sisters, really, waiting on the Lord is not something that is tiresome, but it is it should come with hope and joy. Sir Ellis, your last words for this or your takeaways from our lesson? Uh, for me, ma'am, uh, waiting on the Lord is experiencing God now on daily basis and on weekly basis as we become like Him and as we eagerly wait for His soon return. Thank you very much. Yes, indeed, brothers and sisters. Thank you, Sir Ellis, for that one. Maybe our online viewers also can share how they are waiting for the Lord. That may by sharing, you can also give hope to others. Yes, the concept actually of waiting, uh, particularly in the book of Psalms and in other uh, verses in the Bible, this may denote having and demonstrating an enduring faith. As believers, we are called not to wait upon the Lord for the fulfillment of His promises. Uh, there are a lot of waiting that we have to do. It's part of life. And even waiting for the Lord, it's really was this we cannot do when we are wait, we cannot uh, when we are waiting uh, for something that should be given to us or a service, we cannot do anything but just wait. But in waiting, we cannot we we will not just wait uh, uh, and, and be bored because there are so many things that we can do while we are waiting we can have that hope in the lord and also share that hope with others and that's probably very important because the world is so full of uh hopelessness full of sorrow full of grief but we can share this hope in the lord and again brothers and sisters may i share our text this morning psalm 27 14 it says wait on the lord be of good courage and he shall strengthen your heart wait i say on the lord that's our lesson for this morning thank you very much for sharing your insights with uh with our online audience mom larian and sir ellis and i think i'll i'll ask sir ellis to pray let us pray our loving father in heaven dear god we thank you lord for this another wonderful experience of the discussing and feeding on your word oh god may this will strengthen us and will enrich our but and we'll strengthen our bond and our relationship with you that as we wait lord may that no nothing in this world could distract us could destroy us but even trials and difficulties as we wait for you will strengthen and will make us bold to wait for you lord that to be faithful to you prepare lord that your blessings will be upon us as we continue to worship you today in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you very much, Sir Ellis, for that prayer. And Mom Lauren, again, thank you very much for the two of you for sharing your insights from our lesson. Brothers and sisters, that ends our discussion uh, or the sharing of our lesson for this week. Next week, we will start with a new, uh, was this, with the new... Uh, lesson and that is about great controversy and this is a very important part uh, of our life actually but we enjoin our brothers and sisters online to stay tuned because we are about to start our hour of worship and the hour of worship this morning or the message this morning will be given by brother or judge joseph gidoni valencia and i think he's already there getting ready for the message to be shared and it is entitled the first sacrifice genesis 2 15 to 17. and now we turn you over to the church and have a great and wonderful sabbath day everyone
Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. Praises to God, be to God, and King of Kings and Lords of Lords. Before we start our divine service this morning, let us all sing praises to the Lord. But before that, uh, join me in reverence for a word of prayer. Let us pray. Our dear Father in heaven, we thank you for this Sabbath day that you have given unto us. For the two week, oh God, you are uh, abiding with us and giving us blessings and protection. And please hear us as we uh, bring back the glory and honor to, your, to thy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us sing, um, I'm so glad I'm a part of a family of God. And let us all stand and sh uh, greet all those visitors that we vis uh, that be seated here in our church. Forty one, four, four, one.
next song, let us sing uh, hymn number 27, Rejoice Ye Pure in Heart. Pleasant morning and a happy Sabbath day to everyone. We are so glad you are here today to worship the Lord together with us. In behalf of our church pastor, I would like to welcome everyone this morning. To our visitors, we hope that your time with us offers you the chance to explore and deepen your faith and enrich the love you have for the Lord. This morning, we are blessed to have a lot of visitors with us, and we would like to recognize you this morning. So if your name is called, please stand to be recognized. First on the list, we have Recto family from Romblon. Please stand. To be recognized, Recto family. Okay, they are there at the back. Welcome to CPAC Church. We have also Apolinario family from Candone. Please stand. Apolinario family. Okay. Then we have Ray Gonzalez from Cebu. Ray Gonzalez. Okay, welcome. And also, Pastor Ruben Muralde from Cebu also. Please stand, Pastor. Welcome to CPAC Church. We would like also to welcome Pastor Lorieso and family. Okay, there at the back. Please, thank you. Welcome. 
And also, we would like to welcome AAC Orchestra and team together with the parents and sponsors. Please stand. Okay, they are here in front and together with their parents. Welcome to CPAC Church. Then, Mary Jean Reyes, former CI, Ma'am May Jean Olivares, together with Dexter and Lily Olivares. Please stand. Okay, they are there. Thank you. Welcome. And the last, we would like to welcome also Manong family and Amar family, if they're still around. Okay, they're there. Welcome to CPAC Church. And again, we would like also to acknowledge the donors of our floral offering this morning. We have Saul Royal and family. We have uh, Ma'am Salvation Ban and family. We have uh, Carlos Hardiniano. We have Plaga Herbert Dan and Mr. and Mrs. Dan Manong. Thank you for making our platform beautiful this morning. And to our visitors who were not recognized or who, were, who have not written their names in our guest book, I also welcome you this morning. To our students, to our faculty and staff, and our online viewers, welcome and also our regular members. Let us reflect on this day and give thanks to the Lord our God with a passage that is found in Psalm 100, verses 4 and 5. It says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his court sweet praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues throughout all generations. May we feel God's presence as we worship Him today. Shall we bow our heads? O Lord, our God, the author and finisher of our faith, the giver of every good and perfect gift, Father, your children are gathered here in this sanctuary to worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, may you prepare our hearts and minds as we receive the message for this morning in Christ's name. Amen. For our opening song, let us sing O Day of Rest and Gladness in hymn number, number 382.
I am inviting everyone to the Guardian of Prayer. Brothers and sisters, in the timeless words of Philippians 4, verse 6, we are reminded, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. What a profound invitation this is. An invitation to enter the sanctity of prayer. To lay before our Creator our hopes, fears, and needs. As we navigate the complexities of life, we are summoned into the garden of prayer where the tender petals of our souls unfurl in communion with the divine. In this sacred space, we are encouraged to express our gratitude for the blessings and grace of our lives, to offer thanks to God for the joys that uplift our spirits. Yet prayer is not solely reserved for moments of joy and abundance. It is also our fruits for the weary soul, a sanctuary where we can pour out our sorrows and burdens. When sadness weighs heavy upon our hearts, let us turn to God in prayer, knowing that He listens with compassion and offers solace to our times of needs. Moreover, when challenges and trials loom large on the horizon, prayer becomes our lifeline, a channel through which we can draw upon the infinite strength of our Creator. Let us not shrink in the face of adversity, but rather let us boldly approach the throne of grace, seeking the empowerment and resilience that only God can provide. Brothers and sisters, let us heed the call of prayer with hearts open wide, for our God stands only ready to listen to our every plea. In the sacred intimacy of prayer, may we find not only comfort for our sorrows, but also the courage to face the trials that lie ahead. Together, let us embrace the transformative power of prayer, knowing that God, in God's presence, we find strength, solace, and unwavering love. Let us all kneel. Gracious Heavenly Father, the owner and creator of everything and the sustainer of our being, you are most worthy to be praised and worshiped this holy Sabbath day. We are so grateful, Heavenly Father, for all the things that you have done to each and every one of us all throughout the week, for keeping us safe, giving us strength, and providing our physical and spiritual needs. And as a family of worshipers, Heavenly Father, we are humbly asking for the forgiveness of our sin and the cleansing of our hearts, so that our prayers will be like a sweet incense to your throne of grace and mercy. In a special way, Father, please hear every humble request of your children 
through their silent prayer. Father, you have heard the request. And whatever it is, Father, please grant their petitions. But not according to our will, but according to your righteous will. In the same way, Father, please continue to bless CPAC, the administrators, faculty and staff, and the students. Keep them safe always, Father, and provide them with their daily needs. We pray in a special way also, Father, our speaker, Brother Lidisma, as he will impart to us your words that would nourish our spiritual, that will nourish us spiritually so we can withstand to the test and hardships the world brings. Please, Father, may you will also bless the congregation by sending your holy angels to keep us safe up to the end of our worship. Thank you, Lord, for hearing and answering our prayers. In the name of our Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, amen. Before our deaconesses will receive our tithes and offerings, I will read the tithes and offering, offerings reading entitled, Go into all the world. John 3.16, it says, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God's grace is neither exclusive nor selective. God's love all mankind unconditionally. When he looks at planet Earth, all its inhabitants are object of his mercy and forgiveness. The redemptive vision is given to all, and his grace is extended to each human being on the face of the planet. No one, however sinful he or she may be, is unreachable by the love of God. When Christ was nailed on the cross, he was thinking about the salvation of all mankind. He gave himself as an offering of salvation. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2. And his sacrifice had worldwide effect. God has a worldwide people, a worldwide message, and a worldwide ministry. He offered his son as a sacrifice of salvation with worldwide reach. In all manner, tithes and offerings are presented to the Lord for worldwide purposes. For tithes and offerings to fulfill the mission 
of preaching the gospel all around the world, they must not be used only in local church, but rather circulate the world. Ellen White says, God's money is to be used not only in the immediate vicinity, but in distant countries, in the islands of the sea. If his people do not engage in his work, God will surely remove the power that is not rightly appropriated. Testimonies of the Church, Volume 7, page 215. Tithes and offerings are part of the divine plan to carry the forward, the worldwide work of salvation. They must circle the earth so that the church can reach the goals defined by the Lord. Finally, our faithful promise offerings given as regularly and systematically as the tithes and distributed as suggested by the combined offering plan or COP into those people who live in mountain villages and large cities to Jesus. The combined offering plan proposes that 50 to 60 percent of your promise offerings should help support the missionary work of your local church. 20 to 30 percent should support the regional missionary endeavors of your conferences. And 20% of the World Missionary Fund, which supports overseas missionaries, missions, programs, projects, and institutions focus on preparing more missionaries. Our appeal today, let's give faithfully to God, for His work can be finished and we can meet again in heaven. Our deaconesses is now ready to gather and receive our tithes and offerings.
Let's pray. Our great God, loving Heavenly Father, we acknowledge you as the source of all material blessings we receive from, from thee. O Lord our God, we pray in a very special way that may you bless this amount for the furtherance of your work, particularly reaching people in cities and remote areas. We pray, dear Lord, that you'll continue to bless the sources of our income. We also bless the CPAC and continue to bless also our visitors who come to worship with us with these uh, tithes and offerings. Thank you, the Father, for blessing us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good mo Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Hello. Hello, good morning. I am requesting all the children to come in front for our story this Sabbath. Good morning, kids. Good morning. Good morning. And happy Sabbath. I am your teacher today, Teacher Jeline. Are you all excited for our story today? Yeah. So our story today is about bullying is not right. Who among you here experienced bullying? How's the feeling, my dear? Sad. Sad. How about you? Actually, it's sad. Sad. Who, who else? Oh, how's the feeling? Palanga? You are left out. You are left out. That's so sad. So today, we are going to know the story of Olive. So Olive was super excited because she was going to starting her big school. Olive is a girl. Olive is a girl. Her mama had spent the last few weeks telling her how wonderful it was going to be. They had even practiced spending a whole day doing school activities and the other tasks in their house to see if Olive uh, could stay up all day without a nap in the afternoon. To celebrate her transition to big school, Mama had brought Olive a new lunchbox. Who among you here are excited when your parents brought you a new lunchbox? Wow. How's the feeling if you have a new lunchbox? Good. Good. How about you, Ate? Uh, happy. Hello. How about you, Ate? Thankful. Oh, thankful. Of course, you are thankful to your parents. It was bright orange with balloons on it. That is the design of Olive's lunchbox. Olive couldn't wait to go to school and use her new lunchbox. Early in the morning, before anyone was awake in their house, Olive was up. She snuck up into her parents' room to check if it was the time to get ready for school. But Papa said to her, Olive, sweetheart, you go back to bed and we'll wake you up when it's time to go to school. It didn't seem too long before she heard her Papa calling for her to wake up as it was now to get ready for school. Arriving at school, Mama and Olive went to meet with Miss Amelia. Amelia was the teacher of Olive in her grade 1 school. There were lots of moms and dads bringing their children for their first day of primary school. Who among you here are grade 1 students? How old are you, baby? Six. Six. So, possibly Olive was six years old. How about you, Ate? How old are you? Seven. 
Oh, seven, six or seven. How about you, Ate? How old are you? Eight. Are you grade one? Oh, six, seven or eight. That's uh, next. It was everything Olive had hoped for. Lots of children are reading math, even a sandbox outside in the playground. Olive just knew that school was going to be great fun. Mama sat with Olive for a little while and then Miss Amelia began to thank all the parents for coming to drop off their children at school. However, it was now time for them all to leave. When her mama left, Olive felt the warmth of the sun streaming in through the glass window. Miss Amelia had given her a desk that was close to the window so Olive could look outside at the trees and the sunbox. In the desk next to her was a girl called a uh, name Patricia. Olive smiled at Patricia and whispered, Hello! 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 But Patricia did not even smile back. Instead, she poked her tongue out at Olive. She did it. What did you do? Look. Look. Yes. So, so Olive tried to say hello to Patricia again. But this time, she offered her hand like Mama and Papa had shown her when you met someone new. Patricia took her hand and squeezed it really, really hard. How, try to squeeze your hand like this. Really, really hard. Really, really hard. How's the feeling? Nothing. Oh, nothing. <laughs> It's like I'm gonna be weak. It's like I'm gonna be weak. It's like she's gonna be weak. How about you, Kuya? Normal. Normal. But when Patricia squeezed the hand of Olive, Olive's eyes swelled up and two giant tears rolled down in her cheeks. That's the feeling, or that's the feeling of Olive that time. Thank you so much. Suddenly, big school was not fun anymore. Olive felt all alone and her hand hurt where Patricia had squeezed it. It was only her first day of school and really Olive just wanted it to be over. Mama had told her that if there was any problem to ask Miss Amelia for help. Olive didn't know what to do. And she really wanted to be friends with Patricia, but she was, she was not being nice at all. Olive went to her bag and brought out her brand new lunchbox. Seeing the bright orange color and the balloons made Olive smile. Despite, despite of Patricia, despite of. What Patricia did to her, she smiled when she saw the orange balloon lunch box. Olive ate as, as much as she could but could not finish her lunch because she was looking forward to playing in the sandbox. When the eating time had finished, everyone in grade 1 could return their lunch boxes to their school box before they had a few minutes of play. Olive eagerly packed up her lunch box and then raced back to the sun box. When she arrived at the sun box, Patricia was already there and she said to Olive, You cannot come in here. Olive asked, Why not? And Patricia said, Because I said so. Olive was very unhappy. All the excitement and joy of being in big school was evaporating and Olive felt like she did not belong. Hello. At home, that evening, Mama and Papa had made Olive's favorite dinner to celebrate her first day in grade one. Olive just played with her food. Oh, but Papa asked, Olive, is everything all right? Olive did not say anything to her Papa. So Mama tried, Olive, tell Papa and I about your first day at school. Olive began to talk about her first day at school and when she got to the part where Patricia poked her tongue, poked her tongue out and then how she squeezed her hand really hard, 
tears started to fall down in Olive's cheeks. Mama and Papa look at each other and then they look at Olive. Quickly, they left their chairs and came together to give Olive a big, big hug. Papa pulled Olive close and said to her, So you've had a hard day at school? Olive just nodded her head miserably. Mama and Papa said to Olive, Well, there are two ways we can help you to deal with this issue. Firstly, Mama and I could come with you to school tomorrow and speak with Miss Amelia about the situation. Or we could show you what you can do if Patricia or anybody does something that you are not comfortable with. So Papa and Mama talked with Olive about what she should do and say if anyone was horrible towards her. Papa said, Olive, when somebody does or says anything you do not like, you must say to them in a firm voice, Stop it! Stop it! I don't like what you are doing. Then you must walk away. Sometimes, children, you may meet people like Patricia who behave in an appropriate ways. If this should happen to you, please talk to an adult or let somebody you love and trust you know. How about you? I know the girl can love his mama. Because he, I'm Jordi, because I know what it is. Thank you so much. So for our our key text this morning, it found in Ephesians 4.29. It says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may, it may be benefit those who listen. So children, be kind, be nice, and be good to your classmates because that is our Lord God wants us to do, okay? Who wants to pray? Oh, let's pray, Ate. Let's pray. Oh, let's stand and let's pray. And me too. You want to pray too? Let's pray. Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you for the nice Sabbath. Thank you for being so good to us. Thank you for the nice day. Thank you for giving us Jesus. Thank you for everything. We pray for people who are around us and who are bullying us. We pray that they will become good. Thank you for everything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You can now go back to your mom and dad. Thank you so much. Dilina must stretch, ke Dilina dominant.
before the reading of God's Word, I'd like to introduce first to you God's providential speaker or mouthpiece to us today. He is a graduate from the School of Nursing in 1992 and have served as clinical instructors and then later was called as the Dean of the School of Nursing in Northern Negro State College of Science and Technology. He finished his PhD as well as his law and now he is serving as the presiding judge of La Castellana District, the uh, uh, municipality of La Castellana. And now uh, in our Adventist sitting, he is the president of Adventist Lawyers League of the Philippines. With him is Dr. Maria Luella Lausa Valencia. Doc? Okay. Yes, here's Doc uh, Luella, and uh, he's a fulfilled father of uh, Dr. Marilou Claire Valencia, and with us, uh, Ms. Tresha Rini Valencia, and uh, uh, the student of the law, and, and uh, with them also Vincent Lawrence Kenyao. Brothers and sisters, I have known him to serve the church as an elder in several years and in several terms. He is faithful and now appointed by the Lord to speak to us, Brother Joseph Eugene Valencia. But before he speaks, let's listen first to God's word. center of our study this morning is found in the first book of Moses called Genesis chapter 2 verses 6, 16 and 17. It says, And the Lord God commanded a man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. 17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Good morning, brethren. Good morning. It is a pleasure and an honor and opportunity to stand before you this morning. First of all, allow me to thank uh, Pastor Hintapanan for allowing me, together with the, probably the church board, uh, allowing me to share this uh, pulpit and to deliver God's message for us today. And also, I would want to mention the co-conspirator, the reason why I am here this morning. You know, this is just a short, short, uh, a very quick <laughs> invitation. I don't know if she's here, Mom Donna Aragon, if you're around. Otherwise, I will have to summon, <laughs> to issue a summon against you to appear in my court and explain why you have invited me to speak this morning. I don't know if Mam Aragon is around. So th oh, there she is. So thank you so much, Mam Donna. Mam Donna and I, we were together since high school and then in the nursing school 
uh, in this uh, institution, Central Philippine Adventist College. We graduated together, and uh, we have a very interesting history together. So thank you so much, uh, Ma'am Don. And then uh, allow me also to acknowledge and recognize our beloved president, uh, Ma'am Salazar. Thank you so much, Dr. Salazar for welcoming uh, me and, uh, of course, my, my family. Thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity. Let me also acknowledge those of you who are watching online. I understand my batch, Altruist 92, are also watching. So let me just acknowledge them. Guys, happy Sabbath. We, they, they are spread across, across the globe. No? Mo most of them are in America. Some are in Canada, others in Saudi Arabia, I think. And when they, they heard that we, I will be speaking this morning during, uh, f uh, in our group chat, so they, they told Mam Donna that they, they will be worshiping with us. One of our batchmates, Mr. Ariel Rosas, is here in the Philippines. He's uh, currently in uh, Romblon, and uh, he also messaged me that uh, he will be joining with us in our worship. So I hope that we will be blessed with the message that God has intended for us today. For the past 40 days, the entire world, those uh, with Catholics, with Protestants, have been celebrating what we call the Lent. Lent is a time traditionally set aside for, supposed to be for fasting prayer, and it will, and it culminated, it will culminate tomorrow uh, during the, what they call the Easter Sunday. And uh, this Lent reminds them of uh, the sacrifices or the sacrifice that Christ made or has done to save mankind. Yeah. Right now, we, they call this day, I think it's Bla Black Saturday, if I'm not mistaken. Huh? Black Saturday. At any rate, our message for this morning is entitled, The First Sacrifice. The First Sacrifice. In this study, we will be reminded of the actual first sacrifice, or the first actual sacrifice, and when did it occur. I'm sure most of you have already studied this, and uh, most of you have heard this over and over again, but of course, uh, you cannot do otherwise but to listen and then let's just contemplate. Hopefully, we will have a new insight out of this study. In this study, most of the notes were taken from the study of Pastor Stephen Bohr. Disclaimer, I am not a theologian. As mentioned, I am a nurse by profession. I was here uh, 1988 up to 1992. Um, most of my mentors are already gone. I mean, they have sought uh, employment elsewhere. But I, I understand Mam Gulam, uh, Mam Gulam then, Mrs. Uh, Ms. Fortaleza, Vivian Fortaleza is, the, is with us. I mean, she's back. Uh, she was one of our clinical instructors, our uh, level four coordinator. So just to acknowledge her, uh, one of those individuals who contributed to what I am today. Now. So may I invite everyone to, if you have your Bibles with you, your e-Bibles, get them ready. If you are fond of taking down notes, let's take down some notes and then let's uh, uh, dive and then study this topic, the first sacrifice. Before that, may I invite everyone to please bow down their heads as we seek the Lord in prayer. Shall we pray? O Lord, our God, the author and finisher of our faith, the giver of every good and perfect gift. Father, as we are about to embark on the study of your word, may it be, Lord, that you will send the Holy Spirit to enlighten us, prepare our hearts and minds, cleanse us from all unrighteousness, so that we may be receptive of your message today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So the first sacrifice. To start with, let us... Open our Bibles to Genesis, Genesis 1, 26 and 27. And in these two verses, I want you to discover something. Let me just read 
Genesis 26 and 27. Genesis uh, chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle, over the, all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female. Create, he created them. When I was appointed as presiding judge of the municipality of La Castellana, municipal trial court of La Castellana, I was so excited because one of the powers of the judge is to officiate marriage. So I said, well, this would be the ample opportunity, proper time for me to, you know, uh, send some uh, messages, especially our, the way we, we uh, observe Bible principles. So the first thing that I would, I would uh, tell to the couple when uh, before I give the ceremony proper is to tell them the story of creation. So I was able to insert the creation of man, the creation story, and then tell them that there are only two important institutions that God established during creation. Marriage and the Sabbath. That is why I was also able to insert the observance of the Sabbath day. And why is it important? It's so interesting to note that this is according to my staff in our court. The judge, before you were appointed, few or none at all are, uh, uh, had their, their marriage scheduled here. Mostly, if not in the, in the church, in the mayor's office. But now that you're here, we have scheduled almost every month. Uh, we are not, uh, we, we, we did not get any zero marriage ceremony. Almost every month, we have this marriage ceremony scheduled. And uh, the first time that I delivered my so-called homily before the wedding ceremony proper, uh, my clerk of court had this comment when he was still alive because he, he got sick of COVID and then he died. Uh, he said, Judge, are you a pastor? I said, no, Sir Joel, I'm not a pastor. Why? Because it seems that you have so many verses quoted during your wedding ceremony. It's very unusual. No, I think I'm not a pastor. I'm just a Seventh-day Adventist and a fan of Bible study. So there we go. I, I, I was so thankful to the Lord that he gave me this opportunity to conduct wedding ceremony. So this is talking about how God created man. And I want you to notice two things. The first thing that you have to notice is that the pattern in which God formed man. And whose pattern did God uh, um, uh, patterned man after? Whose pattern is it? It's his image. And of course, the image of God is perfect. So we have this perfect pattern for a perfect image to be created, you know, be created and to be formed into into man. The second thing that I want you to notice is that at that time, since the entire environment was perfect, in fact, every day God pronounced it was good, it was good, it was good. When he created man, it was very good. The environment was perfect. Creation was perfect. There was no sin at the time. Ergo, no death. No sin, no death. Those are the two, two things that I, that I want you to take notice of these two verses that we have just read. Now, the Bible is very clear that from the beginning, it was God's plan that Adam and Eve and the human race would have to live forever. Take note, it was never the plan of God that man should fall into sin. It was his plan that Adam and Eve and the entire human race will live forever. Never was the plan of God to bring death into this world. And it was also God's plan that man has to reflect his own image and likeness while they live forever. But of course, man was not going to live forever because man 
has this immortal soul. We don't have any immortal soul. The Bible makes it very clear that there was a secret for the perpetuation of man's life. And that is mentioned in the Bible. And that secret is the tree of life. Now, let's read Genesis 2.9. It says, And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, this verse tells us that among the trees that God created for food, there are two trees that were specifically mentioned. One is the tree of life and the other, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Let's try to focus our study on these two trees. Now, later on, we'll be talking about the second tree. Let's try to talk first about the first tree. The name of this tree, the tree of the knowledge, uh, the tree of life, is very much suggestive of its purpose. The purpose of the tree of life is what? <laughs> is that it is the tree of life. It gives life. Correct? The purpose is to give life. That is the very reason why God allowed man to continue on e during the time that they have not seen yet. To eat from the tree of life so that they, 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 they will be perp uh, perpetuated with their, with their life. Life will continue on to flow. Now, the source of life, take note, was not inside, but rather it was outside. Again, that is the tree of life. Think of the tree of life as like your battery charger. <laughs> Nowadays, they call it your cell phone, <laughs> cell phone charger. No? It is a battery charger. It is, while, it is, while you are connected with that, your cell phone is charging and it adds life to your, to your cell phone. So the same concept with the tree of life. The tree of life was the battery charger while God was the electrical source. Let me repeat. The tree of life was the battery charger while God was the electrical source. So Adam and Eve had to go to the tree of life to partake of its fruit and recharge of the battery. In fact, remember in Revelation 22, 1 and 2, we are told that when everything is restored, we will find there the tree of life that produces fruit every what? Every, every month, okay, every month. So we are, in, we are to gather to that tree of life and then partake of that fruit every month, every month. All right, so now according to Mrs. White in her book, Healthful Living, page 45, she has this to say, the tree of life possess the power to perpetuate life and as long as they, Adam and Eve, ate of it, they could not die. The lives of the antediluvians were protracted because of the life-giving power of this tree, which was transmitted to them from Adam and Eve. No wonder if you will take a look at their ages from Adam down to Noah. They lived as high as 969, you know, because from Adam, it he was able to partake of the tree of, of life before, before they fell into sin. So probably his genetic makeup was passed on. However, as years went on, as the generations uh, went by, it diminished. Because they were, they were not able to partake of the tree of life. God took the, I mean, lifted up the Garden of Eden from, from the earth. The, the, the tree of life, I would suppose, has already been taken from God. But it will be restored once God will, Christ will come again. So, because of that tree of life, we were told that the antediluvians, they had a human body that was closest to the energy that Adam and Eve had received from the hands of the Creator. Mrs. White, again, in her book, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 60, has this to say. In order to possess an endless existence, men must continue to partake of the tree of life. Deprived of this, his vitality would gradually diminish until life should become extinct. I'm just very sorry you know, because 
some of our brethren would emphasize, ay, vegetarian to sila, that is why naglawig ila kabuhi. <laughs> I would respect, respectfully beg to disagree. Oh, sure, God said, you have to eat fruits, nuts, vegetables, uh, later vegetables, grains, actually would be the, or the original diet that was prescribed by God to man, but it was not because of those. It's because of the tree of life that their lives were extended, they will gain immortality as long as they eat of the tree of life. Now, let's now shift our attention to the other tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Genesis 2, 15 to 17, this is the central text of our study for this morning. It says, Then the Lord God took man the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. 16. And the Lord God commanded man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat of it. For in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. This is the warning that God has given to Adam and Eve. Now, the question is, why did God place the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the midst of the garden? Of course, those of you who are avid fan of Bible study, you would answer me that because man or God would want man to have a freedom of choice, which is correct, which is correct. You see, if God had not placed the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, man would only have one choice, and that is to obey and serve God. No other choice. But by placing this other tree in the garden, God signifies that, hey, you could either obey me or disobey me. You could either follow what I told you or could you, you may not follow what I, I have told you. This is the clearest indication in the Bible that man was created with the freedom of choice. Now, noteworthy to mention that God laid down the ground rules. He defined what was good and what was evil. The problem of man today is that man <laughs> is solely dependent on his knowledge to say what is evil and what is not. That's why we have so many laws. But, of course, hopefully it, those laws are anchored on the Word of God and the principles of God. I was, I was so amazed when I, did, when I engaged in the study of law, I found out that our family code, Executive Order 209, is biblically based. Very nice. I, I really laud our, our, the framers of this law. They based, they based our family code uh, on the Bible. Article 1, the, the, the meaning, the definition of marriage alone will tell you that it's biblically based. According to Article 1, marriage is a special contract of permanent union between a man and a woman. That is precisely why, brethren, we do not and we could not conduct same-sex marriages. Although, although, in Congress right now, there is this... Uh, one, now, right now, I think this, this year, there will be a passage of the absolute divorce law. Absolute divorce law would mean that you could divorce your spouse uh, because of whatever reason you want to. Because one of the reasons is irreconcilable differences. You know, you, you cannot stand the snoring of your spouse. You cannot stand the odor of your spouse. Divorce your spouse. Okay, and then later would be the same-sex marriage. We are the only country in the entire Asia that doesn't, that doesn't have this law yet. Doesn't have this law yet. But anyway, now there's something very important that we find in this one command that God gave Adam and Eve not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In this one command, take note of this, this is very interesting, contained all of the principles of the Ten Commandments. You say, What? By the mere disobedience or eating the, knowledge, uh, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they have broken the Ten Commandments. 
Open your Bibles in James 2.10. If you have your Bibles, if not, it's there on the screen. James 2.10. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. All right. Now, so God said, don't eat of that fruit. Otherwise, you will die. That's a command. So you will ask me, where does the Ten Commandments fit, Judge? Well, let us have some examples just to ground my point. Let me ask you, when Eve decided to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, was she thinking of making herself God? Simple yes would do. <laughs> was she thinking of making herself God? Yes? Yes! So, yes, yes. Why? She wants to be like God. So, what is that? Remember in one of the commandments, you shall have no other gods before me. So she violated the first commandment. Another, did Eve dishonor her creator or her father who is considered their parents that time? Did she? Hello? Yes! Hindi ka mabatiyon sa camera, mga kotoran. So, tunog-tunogan yung yes nyo. Did she? Correct! Yes! What commandment was broken? Fifth commandment. Honor your father and your mother. Di ba? Oh, next. Did Eve, by her sin, bring death to the world? Yes! And when you kill somebody, do you bring life? You bring death. Thou shalt not kill. And many more. We'll be running out of time. So, Eve, by breaking that one commandment, broke the entire Ten Commandments. Now, there's another important principle that we need to remember as we examine this story. 1 John, turn your Bibles to 1 John 3, 4. 1 John 3, 4 says, Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness. So, the question is, was there a law originally in the Garden of Eden for, the, for Adam and Eve to break? The answer is yes. How else could they have sinned if there's no law? You know, in criminal law, we have this principle, nulum crimen, nula pena sine lihe. Meaning to say, there is no crime when there is no law defining it or violating it. No? There is no crime when there is no law that you have violated. That is also true in the concept of, of the uh, story of Adam and Eve. They committed sin simply because the law was already there. Now, let us take a look at the original temptation of Adam and Eve because this mirrors what happened when Lucifer decided to sin against God. We will be studying Genesis 3, focusing more on the first six chapters. Okay. Genesis 3, 1. First verse. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Now here you will notice that Satan was trying to engage Eve into a conversation. Remember, in the story of, I think it's in uh, Patriarchs and Prophets, okay, in the creation story, Mrs. White has this to say, that before they fell into sin, Eve and Adam, they were warned by the angels. Angels were sent to them, do not separate yourself from your husband. That was the warning. But you know, Eve being Eve, wandered, wandered far, and then came close to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And she was able to encounter the serpent, whom that time was a very beautiful uh, creation of God. The serpent had wings, with so many colors, etc., etc. So she was attracted. And she was so amazed that the serpent could talk. So, but of course, we all know that it was possessed by Satan. So Eve said, uh, Satan said, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? He was trying to engage the conversation because human as we are, if a misstatement is given to you, your tendency is to what? 
is to correct. Diba? Is to correct that misstatement. No? I, I see my, my dear professor, uh, engineer Arsenal, chemistry. <laughs> chemistry. And, sir, I think those C plus to ginatag mo sa ako. But anyway, so <laughs> the only A, uh, the only, the, the, the grade that I obtained, the highest grade that I obtained in this institution, English, A minus. No? English, ma'am. Sir Arsenal, do C plus to ginatag sa akong chemistry. If you will talk to Sir Arsenal and you will tell him, Sir, H2O is carbon monoxide. Ah, hambalong ka rin ni Sir Arsenal. F. H2O is what? Water. Di ba? Pero if you will, if you will go to Sir Arsenal, he being the, the expert in chemistry, he would, he would debate you. <laughs> in other words, he would engage into a, a conversation with you. Correcting you, that is a wrong a formula. Okay, so, that is what happened to Eve. She immediately corrected the serpent. And she said, two and three, and the woman said to the serpent, referring to Eve, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but there is an addition. And she added, but of the fruit of the tree of which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, referring to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. What was Eve doing? First of all, she was correcting the misstatement of the devil. She was correcting the misstatement of the devil. Second, she was adding an explanation of what God said would be the consequence of them eating the fruit. You know, in court, one of the evidences that a party can present is a testimonial evidence. In testimonial evidence, a witness is being placed on the witness stand, and then the witness will be undergoing series of examinations. So you have your direct examination. Now, uh, judicial affidavit partakes of the direct examination. So all, all the lawyer could, should do is to have it adopted. And then, Your Honor, uh, this would serve as the direct examination. Those are series of questions that the witness would, should have answered. Then after that, the other party will now conduct a cross-examination. Then after that would be your redirect examination. And the last would be your recross examination On cross-examination, one of the basic uh, well, strategy probably is that you only answer what is being asked. Only answer what is being asked. I found out when I'm already a judge, most of the lawyers, they do not they do not apprise their witness. No? They, do not, they do not conduct a preliminary to their witness. So when on the witness stand, I w would observe that the witness will not only answer what is being asked, sometimes the witness, most of the time, the witness will add something. So I would have to stop the witness. Only answer the question that is being asked. So if the question is answerable by yes or no, you answer either yes or no. Do not explain unless you are told to explain. All right. So this is what Eve did. Not only did she answer the query of the devil, but she added some more. Now, so the devil now has her exactly where he wants uh, Eve to be. On verse 4, Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. Think none of that. You will not surely die. This is another way of saying, and this is the very first lie that the devil has instilled in the mind of the human race. And up until now, it is being carried over. Short of saying that you are immortal. You will not die because you are immortal. Now, actually, you know, Mrs. White described Satan as a master psychologist. <laughs> okay? He cannot read our minds, but he is a psycho. He reads our behavior. So, what Satan was actually trying to do to Eve is called cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance happens when a contradictory information is given to you so that you will wait. 
God said, we will die. But here the serpent said, we will not die. Who is correct now? Cognitive <coughs> dissonance. You're now trying to question the first information that was given to you. Because the second information said, it is the, the direct opposite of the first information. But unknown to Eve, Satan had a plan. Satan had, a, had placed a provoking question in the mind of Eve. And Satan is telling Eve, well, God said that we're going to die. The serpent says we're not going to die. So, <clears throat> if, so if we're not going to die, what ulterior motive would God have? Did you get the point? So Satan is as if telling Eve, if God says you will not die, uh, you will die, but the very fact that you will not die, God is hiding something. That is the insinuation of Satan. Now, another rule in cross-examination, <laughs> matapos ni you will now be masters of cross-examining a witness. But first, become a lawyer before you appear to my court. Huh? Now, <laughs> one rule in cross-examination for lawyers, do not ask questions that you do not know the answer. Ask only questions that you know the answer to that question. That's a very, uh, that's a rule of thumb in cross-examination. So, Satan has a prepared answer on the seemingly boiling question in the mind of Eve. So let us take a look at the ready answer of Satan on the question that he planted in the mind of Eve. The question was, who is really now correct? Is God trying to hide something? So Satan said, take note of this verse. Genesis 3, 5. For God know, this is Satan speaking, as that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now based on this verse, if we could just read between the lines, it would reveal what Satan really wanted Eve to know. One is God is selfish. God is selfish. The phrase God knows indicates that God is trying to withhold something, important information from Eve. Second, the second one is blind obedience. The phrase, your eyes will be opened, indicates God wanted them to be blind, to follow him without any question. And at that stage, it is God who would always lay down the rules, the policy, if you will. And the third, they will be elevated to a higher state. The phrase, like God, would indicate that if they eat of this tree, their status will be promoted and that they will now be equal with God. Fourth, the fourth is the power of independence from God's word. Knowing good and evil connotes that they won't have to live by God's word. You, you yourself, saligi na lang imo kogalingon, you yourself will know what is good and what is evil. And that is the danger there, brethren. If we detach ourselves from studying God's word and knowing his will, letting him define what is good and what is evil, then we will be always at a loss. Always at a loss. I was so happy as a parent. I was so happy when my two daughters asked me, I think that was... Uh, last, late last year, they said, Daddy, we want to have that kind of Bible that you're reading. <laughs> because I'm, I'm always, you know, uh, 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 when I purchased that uh, platinum Bible, okay, from, uh, from uh, I think that's from uh, Facts of Life, uh, uh, Facts, huh? 
Amazing facts, yes. When I purchased it, I was so engrossed with it. Every day I had this habit. I always wake up early in the morning and then read. I have this one-year reading plan every year. So I, unknown to me, these two girls were observing me. So lo and behold, they said just last year, or late last year, Daddy, we want that. Uh, why? We want to adapt what you are doing, you know, reading God's word before anything else. Soon as you wake up, you read, and then, and I said, oh my goodness. You know, I don't know with you, but for me, as a parent, that is enough for me. That is enough for me. My children are trying to anchor themselves on God's word. So that is what Satan has implanted in the mind of, of Eve. Now, Genesis 3, 6 says, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of this fruit and ate. She also gave, her, gave the fruit to her husband, and he ate. And because they have lost, and because of this, Adam and Eve sinned. And the first thing that they lost during the time that they immediately partook of the fruit was the robe, the spiritual robe. Remember, they felt naked. They felt naked. Because they have lost their spiritual robe, something happened to them. Let's read Genesis 3.7. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sawed fig trees together and made themselves coverings. You see, before this, Adam and Eve were covered by the robe of light. This is no uh, uh, artificial garment. They had, don't, don't have any artificial garment. But they were covered by the robe of light. But when they partook of that fruit, the robe of light disappeared. So first, they lost their spiritual robe. And as a consequence, they lost their literal robe of light. And how did they try to solve the problem? They saw fig leaves. Fig leaves. They made themselves covering out of the fig leaves. Now, what do you suppose these fig leaf garments represent? The answer is in the context of Genesis 3, 12 and 13. Then the man said, The woman whom you have given me, or you gave me to be with me, she gave me the tree and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So reading the context of these verses will tell you that the fig leaf garments, they would represent the excuses that Adam and Eve offered for their sin. In other words, they were trying to justify their sin. Were they able to justify their sin? They were not. Another principle in criminal law is that when an individual will, during arraignment, will plea guilty, the plea should not be conditional. The plea should not be conditional. If it is conditional, the court will enter a plea of not guilty. So, if the, if the, the accused will say, Your Honor, I'm guilty, but, you know, because of poverty, Your Honor, this and that, the court will say, Okay, not guilty. Then you have to prove your case that you are not guilty of the crime that you have committed. All right. This is also true in this case, you know. They're trying to justify what they did. But what is interesting is this. Even though they have already covered themselves, but when God came looking for them, they still hid from the presence of God because they still felt naked. To prove to you, let us turn to Genesis 3, 8 to 10. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Verse 9. Then the Lord God called Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden. And I was afraid because I was... They already saw fig leaves. But Adam said, I was naked. And I hid myself. So what nakedness are we talking about here? 
it is not only physical nakedness, because physical nakedness came as a result of losing their spiritual robe of righteousness. Here's another thing. Because they lost their spiritual robe of righteousness, they lost their physical robe of light which had covered them, then they would suffer the ultimate nakedness, which is, according to Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he calls it death. Death. So notice the sequence here. First, they had spiritual nakedness as a result of sin. Then they had physical nakedness since the robe of light left them. Then as a consequence, that is the ultimate nakedness, which is death. But they were not left without a hope. Adam and Eve were shaking and contemplating on the sin and the consequence that they have to suffer, which is the ultimate nakedness of death. And God made this beautiful promise. He said in Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. God is saying that a seed will come out of Eve one day and he will crush and destroy the serpent, which is actually the devil himself. So when Adam and Eve are shaking in anticipation that they're going to suffer the ultimate nakedness, which is death, God in their hearing challenges the serpent. I'm going to send a seed that is going to crush your head. Now, you remember that God said to Adam that the very day that they would eat the fruit, they would surely die. Question is, as soon as they partook of that fruit, did they die? Did they die? Did they die? Did they die? No, they did not. Was God telling a lie? Ah, that is where our topic comes in. The answer lies in Genesis 3.21. Take a look at Genesis 3.21. You see, on that very day, death indeed happened. But... Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. So what do you think you do when you skin an animal? You think if you will remove the, the skin of the animal, the animal will just, you know, be happy and merrily, merrily, the animal will just walk away? You'll have to kill the animal. You'll have to kill the animal. The animal has to be killed. So you see, there was death that very day. There was a lamb that was sacrificed that day. And we have that first sacrifice. You see, when Adam and Eve fell into sin, if you will read the story of redemption, oh, beautiful book. When the angel immediately reported to heaven, Adam and Eve partook of the forbidden fruit the entire heaven was silent, utod. Naglinong. Pareho subong sang kalinong dere. Kaya ang iba naga contemplate na. <laughs> sang kanami, sang minsahe. Naglinong ang langit because they were saddened by the disobedience of our first parents. But, there was one individual, the Son of God. Why siya namunong utod? He approached the light in, uh, encircling the Father. And he said to the Father, you can read this in the story of uh, redemption. Beautiful book as what I have said. He said, Father, now let us implement the plan of salvation. The plan that we have, we have created, we have made even before the foundation of the world. This is now the time, Father. Did the father immediately said yes? If you will read the story of redemption, Mrs. White said when he, she was given the vision, she said, I observed and I saw the Son of God going back and forth for three times, pleading to the father, I beg of you, let us now implement the plan of salvation. And we all know what the plan is that Christ will die. But the Father said, if you will go to earth 
you will put on humanity. You will, you, will, you will mask your divinity. And when you will succumb into temptation and you will fall into sin, you will, we will have eternal loss because you are the only one capable to serve them. Your sacrifice will be the only sacrifice that I will accept to redeem man. But Genesis 3.16 said, For God so loved the world. Referring to God the Father. You know, when my son died, when my son died, it, it, I, I could not explain my feeling. It crushed me. That time, I was in Malacanang. I just passed the bar. I was, all, I was called by Malacanang to serve there. After I passed the bar, this is, and I told the Lord, Lord, this is quite a blessing for me. But three months after, I received a call. The time my wife was pregnant with our third child, she should have been my only boy. And uh, I received a call from sanitarium. And it was the doctor, my, my maninay. Ihado, this is a delicate situation. My wife uh, was suffering from uh, abruptio placenta, profuse bleeding. She said, Ihado, I I could not promise that I will be able to save two lives. It could either be the child or the mother. If that comes into that point, whom will you choose? <laughs> oh my goodness. That was the hardest choice I have ever, ever encountered. And I did not choose it any one of them. I said, God's will, God's will be done. So when, when I, I, I uh, another a few hours passed, I received another call. We were able to save the mother, but we are sorry of your son. The son died. While I was flying from Malacanang to, to here, to Bacolod, I was talking to God. I said, if this is the... <laughs> the exchange of the success that you have given me in the bar and my job now in Malacanang, I would gladly return it back all to you. Only if you would resurrect my son, but of course. <laughs> uh, did not happen. I said, well, uh, could not forget what my wife told me as soon as I... You know, my wife is a converted uh, Seventh-day Adventist. She is a... Full, full-blooded Roman Catholic. Her, her father was formerly a sacristan. Her father was a former mayor of Calatrava. But when I, I went directly to her, to, her, to her room, she told me, Siya, sige lang lang At least we have somebody to look forward to when resurrection morning comes. Amen? Ay, sos, kung hindi pa kamu mag, magmabako do You know, me, I'm a born Seventh-day Adventist. I am the fourth generation of Seventh-day Adventists. My wife just been converted, but you could just, you know, you could just observe and feel the faith of this lady. Ever since she has been our spiritual uh, pillar in the family. Every time something's wrong, problems will come, she would always say, you know. So, I could, I could more or less empathize with what the father is feeling when he said, okay, let us implement the plan of salvation. Now, Mrs. White has this very, very beautiful yet profound um, comment on her magazine called Bible Echo. Let me just read this to you. The instant Adam yielded to Satan's temptation and did the very thing which God had said he should not do, Christ, the Son of God, stood between the living and the dead, saying, let the punishment fall on me. I will stand in man's place. Give him another trial. Transgression placed the whole world under the death sentence, but in heaven there was heard a voice saying, I have found a ransom. And this statement, this statement 
was uh, sustained by the Bible. In 1 Peter 1, 18 to 20, telling us that Jesus was foreordained before the foundation of the world as a lamb. And in Revelation 13, 8, it says that he was slain from the foundation of the world. Not physically, but he was slain in promise. You see, that lamb was the beginning of the sacrificial offering or the sacrificial system. It was representing that someday Christ will come to pay the ransom of their sin that time, Adam and Eve. That's why, yes, death occurred during that day, but it was not them who died. It was that poor old lamb, poor little lamb that died for them, representing Christ that will die for them and has died for us. Beautiful, beautiful love. Sac the first sacrifice. Now, the very day Adam and Eve sinned, Jesus said, I will take upon myself their death penalty. That very day, that's what I have mentioned. The first ceremony was conducted. The very day the first sacrifice was made to ransom men. As we continue to live in this world, stricken with sin, sickness, and as we witness death happening left and right because of this pandemic, remember the first sacrifice made in the Garden of Eden. And that first sacrifice has one earthly reason. Please listen to this song. Summoned from his throne up in the 
sky to purchase my pardon not even the angel could die the only provision for my freedom was destined to be the sweet lamb of glory and his only reason was me that first sacrifice because of us. That one earthly reason is you and I. The first sacrifice provided hope for mankind. The hope that would restore in man the lost image of God. The hope that conquered the ultimate nakedness, which is death. So brethren, stand firm to our faith. It won't be long now. We will be going home. Happy Sabbath to everyone. For our closing song, let us sing the wonder of it all in hymn number 75.
Let us bow our heads. Our most gracious and kind Heavenly Father, we give glory and honor to your name for the message that we have heard this morning through your servant, Judge Valencia. That through your first sacrifice, we are redeemed by your love. And we hope to see you in that heavenly kingdom that you prepared for each one of us. Dismiss us, Lord, with your blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Christ is coming. Oh